Good afternoon. Come on. I know it's day three. I know you just had lunch, but come on. This is the session. We have the closest thing we can get to an astronaut in this room here today. So I've got to get some enthusiasm. He promised he's walking otherwise. So I will not steal a lot of time because we want to listen to the really good parts, which is the next speakers that will come up. I just want to give you the context. This is the session in which we will explore the journey 360 degrees from customer through partner through Microsoft on what we need to do to really land and accelerate the transformation that we've been talking about. Okay? We will give you a perspective from the customer that says, what, what does it look like to deal with people like me, like us, from their perspective, and where could we be better? We'll bring a partner up to talk about their perspective on the same challenge, and then I'll wrap it up with what are the things that we are going to be doing to address some of these fundamental issues. Now, that's plenty of time for me. Let me introduce my boss, my leader, my fearless leader, Patama Chantaruk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. So day three, how many of you were in my main session on Monday? Great. Thank you. And you heard me talk about NASA case. 12 months into my role. You know, I heard so many things about software asset management in such a way that a lot of customer or a lot of partners still thinking or Microsoft people still using it as a verb, like let's Sam customer. But that's not what Sam was. But 12 months, when I saw one publication publish the article that said NASA saved 100 million in software using third-party application or third-party tools, I was so thrilled. I was so thrilled. I pick up the phone try to locate the person, Dr. Daryl Smith, and I was so excited. Guess what I did? Besides try to locate, you know, talking to the account team, I actually reached out, looked him up through LinkedIn, and I immediately tried to connect with him. We are LinkedIn. I'm, I am so sorry. And every day, I check my LinkedIn whether he accept me. <laughs> Dr. Darrell, one week. <laughs> Finally, after he knew who I am, uh, we get on the phone, we talk about you know, the whole challenges. And you saw me using this picture in explaining what software asset management or asset management is all about. It's all about the process to help customer keeping track of what they have, what they're currently using, and what they paid for. So even before you can make any change or drive the acceleration of digital transformation, the customer needs to know what they paid for, what they need, and with that, you know, you see the picture of, you know, the hardware, the asset management from both hardware and software. So with that, you know, we have the privilege of inviting Dr. Darren Smith, the person behind the story of saving, helping NASA save 100 million. So ladies and gentlemen, without taking too much of your time, Please join me to welcome Dr. Darrell Smith on the stage. We are now friends. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I didn't respond to only them, of course, I've been busy with software as a man. Yeah, uh, I'm Daryl Smith. I'm the NASA Agency Software Manager, and I'm 
currently situated at the NASA Shared Services Center. Uh, just to give a little background about NASA Shared Services Center before I get to the presentation. We're located at the Senate Space Center, which is located in Mississippi, along I-10, uh, close to the Gulf of Mexico. And so NASA conducted a competition back in 2005, 2006 timeframe, and um, transitioned distinct functions in the area of human resources, financial, procurement, and information technology to the Shared Services Center. And these are things that are commodity type services that all centers share. But then the centers and executive management determined, you know what? We need to be more focused on the mission as opposed to how we get HR or how we procure software or how we buy hardware. So they transitioned those things to the NSSC for us to be able to standardize services, for us to be able to drive down efficiencies to be able to realize cost savings to redirect to the mission, to our core mission. Anytime when we have scientists and engineers within the agency that are focused more on how they're acquiring those services versus the true mission of NASA, it, it is taken away from resources and time and effort to the primary focus, which is supporting space exploration and also aerospace and science. So with that, um, today I'll be talking about software license management best practices within the agency and as well as the enterprise license management team, ELMT. Okay, so the problem. One of the problems that we were struggling with within the agency over the years is not having an enterprise approach to how we procure software. Um, with that, you know, different centers, programs, and projects were procuring software in multiple ways. You know, hey, integrator, you know, I need this software to be able to support our, our CAD solution, or at least to, to bring CAD solution in the, in, the, in the agency. So they'd say, you know, uh, major provider, go get that software. Or, you know, I'm at a center and I work in the Office of Procurement and I say, you know, we need to buy um, Microsoft Office. So we'll stand up a procurement at our center to buy it. But yet no one else in the agency has visibility in it, what's being bought, whether or not it's needed to be bought, or what it costs. And that goes to the next thing, limited visibility. With things being bought in a decentralized and desegregate kind of method or approach, we lost a lot of visibility in what it was costing us. And then two, with inefficiencies and internal planning, is there a better way for us to be able to procure things? Can we get better insight into who's purchasing what and be able to identify opportunities to be able to drive down our costs to, again, redirect funds and resources to support the mission, as opposed to being focused on buying that particular product? The other problem that we had is that historically, many of the center's programs and projects didn't understand the ecosystem that software publishers operated in. You know, they understand their view of being the customer. I'm the customer, I need to get software. They definitely understood that and understood the publisher. But what about some of the other players in being able to support that software being deployed in the environment or be able to obtain it? You have resellers. Resellers, you know, from a Microsoft standpoint, anytime from NASA, we procure software, don't buy direct. We usually go through a reseller or a distributor to be able to obtain Microsoft products. From a system integrator's perspective, I gave the, um, the example earlier of I have a major integrator at a particular center, let's say Honeywell supporting you know, the Hubble Space Telescope. And I'm a scientist that got her and said, hey, I want to be able to buy the spectral analysis software to be able to do analysis of images that we bring back from Hubble. So that system integrated would, would procure it, but then integrate it into the mission. And then we have instances of like software partners. The software partners are those entities that partner with the publisher that may add expanded functionality beyond what the software publisher provides. And then we have now that's been blowing out through the seams is hosting partners in the area of software as a service. And then, of course, you know, the publishers and the nucleus. The other problem that we had is many didn't really understand 
the business models that most software publishers you know, embarked on in supporting their business. You had sales. Yes, we're looking to be able to get more of our solution set within your company or within the government. And then once we get that new purchase, looking, trying, looking to try to get more uh, customers to be able to procure renewals of that software, the maintenance, to be able to get your patches and your upgrades and, and so forth, supporting that initial software purchase. And then there's also compliance. Compliance is looking and focusing on the review of that license allocation in accordance with the licensing terms and conditions. Now, one of the things, and I'll get in, into this a little bit later, is that everyone's very familiar with the sales and renewal aspect of it, but we didn't really have a good understanding of that last piece of ours, compliance, and how challenging it is, especially when you're looking at licensing terms and conditions, and how that has an impact in your operating model, and also potential out-year costs. And then when you're looking at it from a total cost of ownership perspective, you can't be totally focused on the initial purchase price. You have to look at the total cost of supporting that piece of software in the environment through the entire life cycle. And that also has to do with compliance. Are you, do you have the resources and um, buy-in to be able to manage it through the entire life cycle to mitigate the potential compliance risk? And so, again, software is, is, buying the software is just the tip of the iceberg. And it is, it has multiple complexities associated with it. Looking at it from a government standpoint, you know, most of the time when, when agencies are buying software, uh, or at least in the federal government, you know, we, we, you know, we want that nice shiny thing. You know, Microsoft comes out with this new capability. Ooh, we gotta have that. <laughs> And so when they look to get it, they're only focused on the functionality and then the initial purchase price and potentially the maintenance of that product in the out years, in their budget planning. But one of the things that are, are often overlooked, the terms and conditions of the, of the agreement and how that may introduce additional cost if it may not be managed appropriately in the environment. Then from a government standpoint, we are looking at federal, and then from a NASA standpoint, NASA requirements or federal regulations. We have to make sure that, that software aligns with federal accessibility standards. Um, if the product leverages internet protocols, is it, um, is it in alignment with federal internet protocols version six configuration standards? And then you have to do the risk review to be able to ensure that the software is being procured doesn't in, in, introduce any supply chain risk to the agency from an IT security perspective. And then, of course, you have the laundry list of other security uh, and regulatory things that we have to address. Contract management, that's the ongoing management of the contract and the engagement of the vendor. Software and hardware management. You know, it's one thing to focus on the purchase of the software, but don't have an understanding of the hardware and whether or not those hardware configurations, if they change from the initial purchase date, how that may impact the alignment with the licensing terms and where you may open yourself up to potential compliance risk. And then, of course, license compliance, and then look at the total cost of ownership. You know, when you're factoring in those other areas, you have to factor in the total life cycle of that because laws and regulations constantly change. Licensing terms constantly change. Um, and then uh, the software is updated, which have, may have an impact on the infrastructure that it's supporting. And then now it's a movement to the cloud. All of these things have to be factored into decisions and in tracking potential costs associated with supporting that software. And then, of course, vendor management. And vendor management is, I wouldn't say it's a new concept, but it's one that's being seriously pushed from the administration and also from um, Congress in the form of OMB Memorandum 16-12, which is software category management that was passed in 2016, and also in the Megabyte Act that Congress passed later that year in 2016. So from a NASA perspective, I'm quickly go through this because I want to spend more time on the uh, other charts. 
ELMT, the Enterprise License Management Team, was started in fiscal year 2009 at the request of agency CIO to get better insight into how we procure software and look for consolidation opportunities. Shortly after the ELMT was stood up in fiscal year 2011, we were reorganized at the NSSC out of the CIO's organization into the Office of Procurement because a lot of the functions that were occurring relative to evaluating, reviewing, negotiating and discussing and establishing the relationship with vendors was more of a procurement function that we coordinate with the mission orgs to capture their requirements and then effectively put a vehicle in place that would assist them in achieving their mission objectives. Then we instituted several uh, internal procurement and CIO policies to be able to support the increased use of the ELMT and then NASA, as well as many other agencies, were audited in 2014 by the Government Accountability Office. In that report, NASA, as well as many agencies, had multiple recommendations from GAO to better manage software. But one of the things that I can say is that this is an instance where we didn't need help <laughs> to begin to help ourselves. We had already started to help ourselves in 2008 when we implemented the ELMT. And, and then, of course, Fatar was passed. They strengthened the role of the CIO. And then OMB Memorandum 1612. And then NASA, internally, along shortly after the GAO audit was passed, we were working with the internal missions and orgs to be able to better define our internal policies and set consistent expectations of what was entailed in software asset management, more so software lifecycle management and be able to have that consistent interpretation across not just the institutional side of the house that support the mission, but also the mission organization. So we have a common understanding of what roles and responsibility everyone has in supporting SAM. So benefits of, of managing software. On being memorandum 1612 indicate that agencies shall maintain a, a continuous inventory using automated tools. The Megabyte Act indicated that we must be able to identify 80% of our software license spending using automated tools. Now, mind you, let's, let's say you don't have any tools. and You have all this software. So you have to introduce something in your environment that's going to help you manage the software you already have deployed inventory it, help you to be able to track the cost of it, and be able to report on it per OMB Memorandum 1612 and also the Megabyte Act. But there are inherent benefits to that, which is you know, cost of savings and cost avoidance opportunities. You know, allows you to be able to get better insight what's in the environment so you'll know what you have, so you'll know what you may need or not need. Helps with your cybersecurity <laughs> intrusion and detection because you know what's in the environment, you know where your vulnerabilities are, and you know what things may need to be patched or potentially removed off the wire if there's a potential threat, which helps us in being able to protect NASA's data. And then, of course, audit prevention. Now, I actually need to <laughs> revise that. There's no such thing as audit prevention. It, it, it's audit <laughs> um, mitigation or, you know, proactiveness. <laughs> There's no way to be 100% audit proof unless you go back to paper and pens and carpet paper. <laughs> All right, so then NASA, in alignment with OMB Memorandum 1612 and also the Megabyte Act, had, uh, in coordination with the Office of CIO, major mission organizations, Office of Procurement, Office of General Counsel, had instituted or drafted a new interim directive to better define software lifecycle management within the agency. Now, mind you, we had in our existing project management processes, whether it be institutional admission, requirements for organization to be able to manage software. But the challenge is, on the mission side, there was an expectation of what is entitled or what was entailed with software license management, which differed from that was on the institution. And that's one of the things we tried to clarify with the NID. All right, ELMT, and, uh, again, is NASA's version of vendor management. 
um, we're responsible in being able to seek out contract consolidation opportunities, and be able to provide better insight in the area of asset inventory using existing tools that we have. And we have an array of tools that we use, both from an IT security perspective and also in um, other organizational perspective to help them to be able to track and manage software. And then we provide financial transparency, what organizations are spending, what opportunities do we have to be able to reduce costs or potentially increase opportunities to be able to leverage existing solutions that are in the environment, which is based on NASA strategic sourcing. And NASA strategic sourcing is basically getting better business intelligence about what we do and how we do it before we engage the vendor. Now, from 2011 to 2016, ELMT realized approximately $103 million in cost avoidance from being able to put better solutions in place that promoted timely and efficient procuring of, of software and identified areas that we didn't need to potentially procure software and use, reutilize existing assets in the environment. But one of the things I want to bring to note, in 2014, we may have been looking at 30 agreements, but we only were able to get a handful in place. Why? Because of the contract complexity, license term complexity. If we didn't have the complexities with the licensing terms, heck, we could have potentially got 60 agreements by year two. And we could have doubled that by now. But the reason why it takes so long is because we have to constantly review license terms to ensure they align with federal law, the FAR, and NASA FAR supplement, and also look to be able to reduce programmatic risk. So from a vendor management perspective, one of the things that we try to do is promote a strategic relationship with software publishers. And part of that is coordination, communication, cooperation, and collaboration. Coordination is understanding what may be incentivizing the vendor. Learn more about their business. Learn more and engage your stakeholders on what it is that we're trying to achieve. Then we communicate with the publisher proactively. So, okay, you're in it to make a profit. We're in it to be able to reduce, get reduced costs and get that new shiny thing. So how can we collaborate to build a win-win relationship? Cooperation is codifying that discussion relative to license terms and conditions in the form of contract action. And then collaboration is the ongoing management and maintenance of that agreement with the vendor. So with that said, there is an opportunity for software publishers and tool vendors to be able to partner to build solutions that bring value to the customer, as opposed to just solely be focusing on gaps. It would be great that of the solutions that we have in place had a built-in capability that helped us manage it, as opposed to, okay, we built the solution, we sold it to you, now it's your responsibility to be able to track it. it it's an opportunity to be able to enhance the relationship and be a strategic partner as opposed to be solely focused on, let's see where we can identify a gap and sell them something else. And mind you, from a government perspective, we can't go knocking on Congress's door and say, all right, we got this new solution and none of our tools currently fit the need, so now we gotta buy something else to introduce into our environment and address all these things to be able to get it in place. And oh, by the way, in two, three years, it'll probably be obsolete and we gotta buy something else. So again, it's an opportunity to be able to demonstrate that it's a strategic partnership between whether it be government or even corporate America to be able to offer solutions that bring better value. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Sarah. Uh, no So you know, what do you say after that, right? Um, to me, this, this illustrates what Patama's slide on Monday is all about. You remember the slide where she talked about threat and opportunity? The complexity we create is off the charts, and it is us who create it. So we need to look at that as an opportunity for us to do better and to help simplify these things. I love how Daryl phrases this in the sense of what NASA has done to deal with the complexity. But when you listen carefully, there is a 
there is a, a tone there that says, but why am I doing this? As Daryl told me this morning over breakfast, it isn't rocket science, but they'd love to be focused on rocket science rather than this. So that's the customer perspective. And I think it illustrates the complexity we created. And very often, the first thing that people do when they start thinking about solving that is, oh, let's get a tool. And so the tool perspective in this is very, very important as well. But I think when we look at that perspective, we'll come to the conclusion that the complexity is too great to just you know, flip a switch and be done with it as well. But to explain us how we look at that, let me invite up on stage Jim Ryan from Flixera um, to talk us through the, the, the partner perspective. Appreciate it. Where companies actually talking to their customers about making the way in which they manage their software that they buy from do. We have been talking about this at Flexera Software for many, many years. And for many years, we kept saying to ourselves, if only some of the major software providers would put themselves in the chair of their customers and understand just how painful it is to manage their estate. And it's not just a Microsoft problem, as you, know, you all know. Right? I'm going to make a statement that, that, that's not controversial. Software is eating the world. Mark Andreessen coined that phrase many years ago. It's in everything we do in our professional and our personal lives. And to quantify it, we know that it's a $350 billion a year industry and growing. Now, if we were to have this conversation 10 years ago, it would have centered around desktop applications, perhaps SQL Server software that's running in a server environment, on-prem software. That in and of itself was nasty and problematic enough, but today's conversation doesn't stop at desktop and data center software. We have conversations about cloud, public cloud, private cloud, hybrid cloud, virtualized containers, making the fact that software is eating the world all the more prevalent in each and everything we do, and making the iceberg below the tip that Daryl talked about all the more important that we focus on it. To further drive home the point, let's talk about IoT briefly. Perhaps one of the most hyped up things in industry today, so hyped up that General Electric, the people that have been bringing us light bulbs for a century, are advertising the fact that they're a software company. And if you fast forward to just 2025, which will be here before we know it, there's gonna be 80 billion hardware devices. And it's not the hardware that will be manufactured in China or some other country in Asia Pacific that's low end, commoditized, and adding zero value to the IoT. Software will be the proverbial straw that stirs the drink in IoT. And there will come a day when the plant floor manager managing a manufacturing facility will look an awful lot like today's CIO that will have to be dealing with software and contracts and entitlements and asset management. Software permeates everything we do. But for those of you in the know, if there's any executives in the room and you don't know this, I would encourage you to talk to the people that work to you. For those of you in the know that are in the business and have been involved with software, you know that the software industry has a dirty, dirty little secret. We know what that dirty little secret is. The dirty little secret is that the software industry, and I've deliberately put that in quotations, if you look at the software industry as a supply chain, I put it in, in, in quotations, it's the single most dysfunctional supply chain in all of industry today. I challenge you to find another industry, whether it's retail, automotive, electrical, monopolistic, bureaucratic, electrical companies, are not as dysfunctional and chaotic and difficult to manage as software is. And it's important that you step back and get in the mindset of viewing this as a supply chain because it's not about the tooling. I happen to work for a company that provides a great solution, but the world's greatest solution will not help you generate 104 million in cost avoidance like Daryl's been able to do at NASA unless you step back and take a programmatic view of this problem and take a look at it from a supply chain perspective like all normal, mature, healthy industries tend to do. This dysfunction costs literally tens of billions of dollars in waste and inefficiency in the industry. I would submit, depending on the size of your company, it is costing you millions, tens of millions, significant amount of money in terms of this dysfunction here. 
But it's not just the money that you should care about. It, it's the risk here. This dysfunction injects risk into every single company, government agency, and our own households around the world. If you don't know where your assets are, if you don't know who is using what, where they're using it, and what the heck is going on in your software estate, how do you know where the applications are that don't have the latest and greatest patches for Microsoft, for Oracle, for SAP? These are the holes that are injecting risk. So when you're going out to your executives trying to educate them on why software asset management is so important, and you can't get them to your think, line of thinking around the financial benefits, talk to them about the security risks. Because foundational to any great cybersecurity program is you better understand what your asset management landscape looks like. So let, let's talk about a highly efficient supply chain. Every other industry has a highly efficient supply chain. You have suppliers of a product. These suppliers basically manufacture and supply products. They're safe and secure, that's implied. And the only time somebody talks about audit is during tax season. If you're a buyer of said product, it's pretty straightforward as well. They only use what they've paid for, that's very straightforward. The only time they talk about audit, again, is with an accountant during the tax time. And the suppliers actually manage their inventory in many cases. The next time you're in Target or a supermarket, take a look at the toothpaste and the deodorant you're buying. It is not Walmart or Target that's responsible for managing the shelves and replenishing the inventory. It's Procter & Gamble. And it wasn't until the 1980s when Walmart and Procter & Gamble had an epiphany that they could eliminate the waste and inefficiency in their supply chain that they started to do things better and differently. So today, when you go and buy the toothpaste, the toothpaste exists because Procter & Gamble sees what the inventory is looking like. Procter & Gamble determines when it gets below its replenishment levels and refills it. There's complete transparency and complete alignment between the supplier and the buyer in retail. The same exists in automotive. The same exists in healthy, mature supply chains. There's too much waste and dysfunction in software today, and that's why it's so refreshing and exciting to see Microsoft up here trying to become part of the solution versus part of the problem. So again, an efficient supply chain has transparency. That, that is the operative word for me. It's transparency. Transparency into what's been purchased, what's been or has been used, and therefore what financial uh, payment is owed or not owed. That, that is what mature and efficient supply chains bring to bear here. And what we're doing at Flexair and what we're doing in conjunction with Microsoft and why we're so excited is that together we're reimagining the way software can be bought, sold, managed, and secured. Again, I'm not trying to reimagine how I sell a product to you. And I, I, would, I would plead with each and every one of you to take a broader view into the potential way to go and address this because it's not just about the technology and it's not just about Microsoft, it's about stepping back and trying to reimagine how you put a vendor management program together like we've done at, at NASA or, or, or like, uh, like other forward-thinking companies are doing. You, you have to go from cradle to grave and really process that out before you can go and fix it. So we're going to do that, uh, and you're going to hear from Roll here on, on how we're going to do that. I love the metaphor of the electric meter. So I live in Chicago. I get my electricity from Commonwealth Edison. They're about as fat, bloated, and bureaucratic, semi-monopolistic as you're ever going to get in an agency. And yet for as long as I've lived in my house, I have religiously paid my electrical bill and never had a dispute with them, ever. And software is very, very similar to electricity. You cannot touch it. You cannot feel it. You have no idea how much is being used up in my daughter's bedroom versus the coffee pot in my kitchen. And yet you've got this bureaucratic company that sends me a bill and a single version of the truth that I never dispute. If it can be done by Commonwealth Edison, certainly it can be done with Microsoft and Flexera and some of the greatest minds in the business here. And I think what Microsoft's about to announce or has announced with Intelligent Asset Manager is a necessary first step where a supplier of software is stepping back and saying there is a better way. Where a supplier of software is saying let me help you better manage the things that, you're that I'm selling to you. 
with the premise or the investment thesis of if I do that and I really understand what you're using and where you're getting value, a rising tide will lift both boats and you'll buy more software from them down the road versus showing up every three years and beating you over the head with a stick. Um, so, so we're very excited about what, uh, what Microsoft's doing. We think that that will enable Flexera and technology suppliers alike to become a utility meter like so that we can both be looking at the same sets of data and when that invoice comes, there's really no dispute. It's just simply a financial transaction. And that includes you need to recognize what applications are out in the ether. You have vendor supplied licensing rules that you don't have to interpret because the supplier is giving them to you. They also will, will publish all of the entitlements so that you don't have to get that from your procurement department that's in a PDF file or a physical drawer where the contract has been printed. And if you then couple that with ways in which the supplier can help you manage your inventory, which the supplier can tell you what your usage rights are and give you that baseline, if we can institutionalize that into the technology, wrap people and processes around that, we think that trust and transparency can begin to occur in the supply chain. Now, it's a, it's a long, long journey. We may never get there or we may die trying, but it's a necessary first step to try and get to there. Uh, and again, kudos to Microsoft and, and, and Patima's uh, team for, for recognizing that there is a better way. Uh, we, we love the conversations we've been having with Microsoft to date. When we, when we were listening to Roll's vision, we said, man, that sounds exactly like our vision. Let's reimagine the way software is bought, sold, managed, and secured. Flexera, Microsoft, and the whole ecosystem of the solution providers, along with forward-thinking customers like NASA, uh, we're very excited about the announcement uh, here from Microsoft. I'm very appreciative for all of you listening in on this session. Thank you for your time. Back to Ron. Thank you. That was awesome. Okay, I, I, I realize I keep setting myself up for failure here, don't I? First Daryl, then Jim, what am I going to do? Um, but let me give you the context of what I was trying to do with all of this. Um, a year ago, I was on vacation, right, Putama? You will, not, you will not cease to remind me. I was on vacation. I was in the south of France with my family, enjoying some downtime, when um, I got a text message saying, yeah, just so you know, you uh, are now responsible for getting this workspace thing fixed, and you got 12 months, because otherwise I'm going to kill it. Something along those lines. Uh, so first I realized I have a new job, that was good. Uh, and second of all, the clock is ticking. And what I realized is, you know, we, we've been pushing tooling, we've been pushing systems, we've been pushing ways of doing things, but what we really hadn't established any clarity on was the crucial question of why. What are we really trying to do and why are we doing it? Because is the world really needing one more Tool. Daryl, do we need another tool? We good? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> to say, is that a Daryl Smith, not that of NASA? <laughs> no, we don't need any tools. <laughs> so, that was not the answer, but that was kind of where we were going for a while. So we needed to really do some thinking about what we wanted to, uh, to achieve with the work that we were doing. So, first of all, what really helped me was grounding our mission and our, our, our plan for what we were doing in the mission and the strategy that Patama had le led the team to establish. And the key point here is all the things we've been talking about this week. We are in the business of helping organizations maximize value and minimize risks. So the first thing I wanted to do was make sure that when we started looking at systems and tooling, we looked at, okay, what is it our systems and our tools need to do to help achieve that? Um, and we have to do that as the strategy dictates through partners because there is absolutely no way we could do it any other way. At the upside, at the opportunity side of that spectrum, the, the, the opportunity was tremendous. If we can get this fixed, if you listen to the stories from Daryl and Jim, the complexity is through the roof. If we can even make a small dent in that, we are starting on that journey to reimagine the way software is sold, bought, managed, and secured. So that was, that was the grounding that we took. Um, so from there, we looked at all the changes that the team was making. And there is a tremendous amount of change that we announced on Monday. And it's all 
relevant because none of these pieces have any meaning in isolation. I can change all the tools I want, but if our field is paid to go find gaps, that's what they will go do. So it's really cool to see all these things come together to start to really accelerate that transformation towards that vision that we have. So I'm really excited about the changes that we announced. And what I'll do in the next few slides is walk you through the specifics of what we're changing on the systems and tools side to start addressing some of these things. Now, none of these things would happen in isolation if it was just us driving. And one of the first things I did when I got back from my vacation in France was um, establish a steering committee of partners that I gave um, formal approver status over the, the SAM tools strategy. So let that sink in for a minute, right? So instead of us saying, here's what we're going to do, get on board, we brought together a group of field and partner representatives and hashed out what the strategy should be with my commitment that we weren't moving forward until the partners and the field representatives said, yes, this now actually makes sense. And we have some of the people in, in the room here. I see Gare right there. I don't know if, if any of the others are here. Um, but these people helped shape what this strategy is. Then from there, this thing has grown. And I'm not in the business of saying this tool or that tool is better than the other because I think there's a lot of really good IP out there. But all of us have been trying to boil the ocean and fix greater complexity than each and every one of us individually can fix. So we got to work together to, to address this. So what excites me the most this week is this slide growing on a day-by-day -day basis with more partners saying, you know what, I got a tool and I want to integrate with what you're doing. I got a business that wants to start doing things differently. I don't want to be in the business of creating ELPs if I don't have to because I'm not in the business of arguing whose tool is better. I'm done with that. I'm not in the business of arguing who can do an ELP better. Done with that as well. If we want to really transform and address that big opportunity that Satya keeps talking about in that beautiful bubble slide, we'll need to reimagine what we're doing and we'll start with breaking down boundaries, building new partnerships and working together to address this complexity. So let me talk a little bit about what we are doing. On Monday, Patama introduced the Intelligent Asset Manager. So what this really is, is the next incarnation of what we all came to love and like as workspace. Um, originally, the notion of workspace was tooling we gave to partners to be yet another way of doing the same thing. Through this work that I did with the partners with the steering committee, we established a very new vision for what we want this to be. And really, is centered around accelerating the digital transformation. It is totally connected to the vision that the company is pursuing and the mission that Patama set out for our team. It is simplifying the way you interact with us at the core of what we do to make sure that we have a more efficient business model. And why do we want that? If you, think, if you listen to the, the stories before, you know, what, what is the old behavior that we saw, we'll come in every other year, every third year, give a customer an invoice and move on. What we want to move to is constant proactive engagement with the customer, working in partnership with tools and with customers to get them valuable, valuable information and insight rather than this reactive behavior. So for me, the notion of more engagements is not, you know, can we do more engagements? It is, can we accelerate the number of times we talk to customers, provide information to the customer without focusing on the ELP. ELP is not part of that discussion necessarily. It is all about inventory to value discussion, but then we need to simplify things to get there. So the pillars on which Intelligent Asset Manager is built are very fundamentally different than the notion that we had when we first came up with the concept of workspace. There's really two core elements to what we are doing. The first one some of you have heard about is the notion of centralizing the ELP creation. The reason for that is, is very simple from my perspective. First and foremost, if we say we want to transform uh, our focus from gap to value, but 30 to 35% of your cost as a partner is in the resources and the knowledge you need to create the ELP, th there's tension in that model. We've got to do that differently. Um, so we need to reduce 
the complexity that's in the model. The other one is, uh, as Daryl said in his last slide, is if we want to get greater focus on that value piece over finding gaps, we gotta make sure that partner's focus is where it needs to be, not on the, the creation of the ELP necessarily. And as Jim said, a single version of the truth is essential. But right now, and many of you have heard me ask you this question, but if I give 10 partners the exact same customer inventory and entitlement data in the current world, how many different ELPs do I get? Thank you, Errol. At least 12, right? <laughs> At least 12, because most companies have multiple consultants and they cannot agree. That's the reality. So that is just for Microsoft. So if that is our operating model, how far are we from a single version of the truth? So those things to me are you know, very crisp and clear that we need to do that differently. And so one main pillar of the intelligent asset management platform is going to be that centralized creation of ELPs. If and when required, which is not in every engagement. Let's be very clear on that. Okay. So from my perspective, if the customer engagement says, we're just going to look at this from a cybersecurity thing and there's no ELP required, go, let's go. But if an ELP is required, let's run that through that central service so we can all have the same interpretation of things. The second pillar is newer. It is the, the work that we've been doing around the universal inventory. Um, and to me, there's, there's even more passion there than around that ELP service. And that is because I believe so strongly that the next great tool opportunity for SAM is in tools that look at analyzing, visualizing, representing, distributing that rich inventory data and giving meaningful information back to the customer. But that requires that we build tools that do that rather than build tools that do the reconciliation piece. So for me, enabling the growth of that ecosystem of value tools is crucial, but right now, that is not very efficient because every time that we want to get something in front of a customer or do something, what do we need to go do first? Install a different tool to get the inventory. And that is not efficient. Um, so back to the points that, that were made earlier about you know, uniform inventory gathering and automating and, and, and uh, making sure that we have security around the data would be another argument that I would have. The, the, the question I would ask any consultant in this room today is, do you have a USB thumb drive on you? Does it have any customer confidential information on it by any chance? Because I know they're out there. I've seen spreadsheets floating around. I see them being emailed. You know, there's things like GDPR and other things coming that really up the game in terms of how important data protection, data security is going to be in the future. It's only going to increase. And if we have disparate systems loose connections, it is not a very efficient, not a very safe, not a very secure way of doing that. But by centralizing some of these elements, we can do a lot better job in terms of protecting customers' data. So let's look at that in a little bit more detail. The centralized DLP service, you've heard me talk about, the core concept here is removing the complexity of creating an ELP to the degree that we can. It will never be, you know, 100% done, we will always need partners to provide the interaction with the customer, the establishment of the inventory, and, and the establishment of the entitlements. But there's a big chunk of work that if an ELP is required, and I'm thinking of true up coming up, uh, merger and acquisition scenario, or any other scenario whereby the customer says, you know what, I really need to know where I stand from a licensing perspective, that we have a single version of the truth that does that without you needing to maintain expensive resources that constantly chase the latest changes in our licensing complexity. The way Patama put it to us on Monday is, we created the complexity. We owe it to you, we owe it to our customers to take back responsibility for fixing some of that complexity. So that to me is a very important part. Um, the, the inventory part, um, the key message I want you to remember from there, other than you know, the security part is, Today, we have a few, we have a handful tools that we can tell to our customers, hey, if you want to get a, a view in terms of how to migrate to the cloud, how to look at server consolidation, but it's just a handful. And I believe that there is tremendous opportunity for more tools to be created for more different perspectives, for more innovation, for more creativity to be used there. Um, but right now, those tools are limited by the fact that they all have to go and get their own inventory 
before they can do anything. The notion of the universal inventory, what really excites me is that we have a prototype live with data from Flexera flowing in, with data from other tool providers flowing in, and coming out and being able to be used in a uniform manner. So if you want to go build tools that consume this data, you know what the data points are that are going to be there. You know what the format is that is going to be there. So you don't have to go do everything. You don't have to do the ELP because I can do that. You don't have to do the inventory because there's tools that can parse it through. There's really greater opportunity if we split the work and specialize rather than all of us try, try to boil the ocean. So with that, um, I have a call to action for you based on what we are sharing uh, with all the things that we looked at this week. The first one is uh, to focus on the inventory to value discussion, now for real. Not, no longer, we're no longer talking about this or just putting this on slides. With all the changes that we showed you um, this week, there is no more excuse to say, no, I'm, I, you know, my, my business is, is ELP. That is not where we are going. And we want to make sure that the tools and the services are there to enable you to do that. So take advantage of that. The centralized ELP work, the service, it is available, it will remain available, it will only grow. So don't hesitate to get stuck in to figure out how to use it and make it help you grow your business. The second one is around tools. Um, we have a running list, and I think we stopped counting at 146, right? But actually, the, the, the number in the spreadsheet is around 170 odd by now, I think. But at some point, we couldn't take it anymore. Uh, don't create more tools that do stuff that already exists, because it's simply not efficient. We got to leverage things that exist and get smarter of do, about doing what we do. And the workspace universe, or so, oh, I said it, I need to pay you $5, right? The intelligent asset manager universal inventory concept is all about making sure that if your customer is invested in Flexera, if your customer is invested in Snow, if your customer is invested in Land Sweeper, that's great. That, you know, don't go tell them, oh, you need to use yet another inventory tool. Let's make sure we are using what exists and we are getting that data and parse it through uh, in an efficient way. And it's really exciting that we have that connection complete for a few tools. Flexera was the first one, uh, which I'm really grateful for. They helped us define the concept. But we have more connections live by now. And to me, that, that goes to that simplicity and efficiency thing, whereby, hey, if your customer is using this, you know that there's a straight upload into the, the intelligent asset manager without you needing to go and do all the heavy lifting and combining of the data in between. So that leads me to my final call to action, which is to specialize and use others to scale out. We cannot continue to think of this as, I got to do it all. I got to do and inventory and reconciliation and deliver the value to the customer. We got to start really leveraging each other. There is great IP in this room. There's great IP in this ecosystem. There's great talent in the ecosystem. But as long as we see each other mainly as competitors rather than accelerators to get to that 450 trillion, was that the number, uh, opportunity, um, we're missing the point. The complexity that people have to deal with is off the charts. And as long as we keep sort of like looking at each other and navel gazing, we're missing the point. NASA needs to be putting people on Mars. NASA needs not spend all their time trying to make sense of our complex licensing. That's where I would like to leave it. Now with that, I'll ask Jim and Daryl to join me. If there are any questions, uh, we can take those. But with that, that concludes my part. Thank you very much. Any questions, anyone? wants to go first, Vaughn. I'd like to make a comment. You know, um, there were several points that were made um, relative to a strategic goal that Microsoft is trying to achieve with partners. Now, I can say that it, it, it warms my heart <laughs> to hear a major publisher discussing bringing solutions to the table as opposed to trying to do an upsell to sell me something else. There, historically, you know, I've been at the agency for roughly 18 years. Um, there have been multiple times over my 18 year career in, in different uh, capacities that we've had multiple publishers come in and say, 
you know, we, we're going to help you identify your gaps. And part of identifying gaps, we're purchasing something to be able to address a compliance issue. As opposed to, let's look at the solutions that we currently have in the environment and see where we can try to enhance existing capabilities. And we want to partner with you to help you enable your mission. Now, if we could redirect every instance that we've had to address a compliance issue and focus those funds to go towards admission, that is bring true value to really help the agency, as opposed to trying to upsell us on another tool. So, I'm, I'm, and this is just a, a, a general statement to publishers. You know, I had those, the, the three business models, sales, renewals, and compliance. If it could be more focused on sales with renewals, but then add inventory across the spectrum, and it'd be less of a focus on compliance, then that brings true value. Now, I, now, from a compliance perspective, yes, publishers and tool makers, you're entitled to be able to protect your IP, your intellectual property. But guess what? There are federal laws from a government standpoint that protect that. And guess what? If we take advantage of it from a government perspective, I'll be wearing things that I don't like, neon and stripes. <laughs> I hate neon and I hate stripes. <laughs> So there are protections there. So instead of focusing on, from, from a near-term perspective, you know, yes, you're going to get revenue recognition. But guess what? You'll get revenue recognition if you partner with us. Because what happens is, when the next new shiny thing comes out that may really help us from a mission perspective, we may be hesitant to look at that solution because of that bad experience that we had from that compliance engagement. And so instead of looking for uh, a solution that may help to enable more of what we do, we may settle for something less because we don't want to have that engagement again down the road because now that we bought this, now we have to look at another solution to potentially help us manage it once we introduce it into our environment, as opposed to be focusing on furthering science, aeronautics, and sending a man to Mars and back. That's what would truly bring value, at least from a NASA perspective. And I'm sure many other government agencies would say the same in support of their missions. So, uh, thank you all.